International Higher Education, we are very pleased to welcome our panelists to discuss uh, liberal arts education um, today. So uh, just very briefly, um, welcome everyone. And uh, the way our webinars work is we ask you to please keep yourself uh, muted during, uh, during our webinar. Uh, we invite you, of course, to be very engaged with your questions and comments using the chat function. Uh, please do that and we will be um, answering questions and presenting those questions to our panel um, in, the, in the sequence that they are uh, presented in the chat. So there is no need to wait until the end. You can present your comments and questions throughout the duration of our webinar. Um, so the way it will work is we'll have some opening remarks by each of our panelists. We are joined by Philip Albach, who is research professor and distinguished fellow here at the Center for International Higher Education. We are also joined by Dr. Kara Godwin, who is the director of internationalization at the American Council um, on Education, where she leads the internationalization laboratory and contributes to ACE's global research initiatives. Uh, and I must say, welcome back to Kara, who is a graduate of, uh, of the center. Uh, we also are joined by Dr. Hui Yuan Ye, who, is, uh, who has been a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh's Institute for International Studies in Education. He also has worked at Southern New Hampshire University in their College for America programs. And currently, he is a research fellow with Duke Kunshan University, um, as well as the associate editor of, inter of the International Academic Forum Journal uh, of Education, as well as a visiting uh, scholar here in the Center for International Higher Education. So thank you all uh, for joining us and to our three panelists today. And um, I have now the pleasure of, introdu of introducing Phil Albach. Thank you very much. Um, it really is a pleasure for me to uh, provide a really brief introduction to our uh, uh, conversation uh, this afternoon because this is a topic, in my view, of great importance uh, and one which is increasingly, I think, a little bit controversial around the world. Uh, I think we'll be discussing what might be the future of liberal education in, in, in the countries where it exists, uh, but I think it's a topic of, of, of great importance. Um, if I can spend just a minute of autobiography. Um, my undergraduate education at the University of Chicago was deep in liberal education. Chicago in those days, uh, before the invention of the wheel, um, uh, had, a, had and still has a very strong commitment. So what they wanted to do was introduce us to how to think and introduce us to basic knowledge. So when we were learning about philosophy, we read Aristotle, not in the original Greek, but anyway, Aristotle. When we were learning about ethics, we read Confucius, the Analects. When we were learning about religion, we read the Quran and we read St. Augustine. And when we were learning about science, we read Charles Darwin and so on and so on. For me, it was a transformative experience. And I think for many of, many of us maybe involved in this discussion uh, who've had a liberal education would probably agree with me. And it has shaped the way I think ever since. So it, it's important. Uh, and I have my own sort of personal commitment to the idea. Liberal education is a minority phenomenon everywhere. In most of the world, it doesn't exist, you know? Um, uh, and in countries where it does exist, such as the United States, and in some ways in, in uh, Britain, um, uh, it's under some kind of uh, threat. Um, so I think that's an important uh, aspect. 
liberal education has always been seen as a kind of a preserve of the elite. And I think it's highly unfortunate that that is the case. Um, liberal education has taken hold in a very, very small way in China. I would say thinking about it rather than actually doing much of it. It's taken hold in a big way in Hong Kong, which transformed its higher education uh, arrangements in uh, a, a decade ago to uh, have liberal education. And now many critics on the conservative side on the mainland are saying, all these people in Hong Kong are thinking for themselves, bad idea. Um, so, um, and we'll be hearing a little bit about the China situation because I think it's really illustrative and very uh, interesting. I think, as I said, liberal education has a little bit of a murky future. Um, some minority of American universities and colleges still have a strong commitment to liberal education. We hear, however, much more discussion of what's called workforce development and things of that sort. And that argues in some ways against uh, a traditional idea of liberal education. My own commit feeling, commitment, is that workforce means flexibility. It means thinking. It means being able to adjust to a wide variety of experiences. And thus, it's extremely important uh, that, that uh, critical thinking and the kind of broad knowledge base that liberal education provides should be part of the system. So those are a few introductory remarks to get us going. Um, let me now turn it over to my distinguished colleague, Kara Godwin to uh, give us some further thoughts. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Phil. This is a topic of longtime interest for me, and it's especially fun to be here presenting today, not only because CIHE is still near and dear to my heart, um, but because my scholarly relationship with this topic is highly influenced by my early work with Phil and Hans and Karen, who are all on this call. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be talking about this again with this particular group. Um, my goal today in the next few minutes is to really raise more questions um, than to impart any kind of answers. But I hope that our discussion will fuel some new thinking about where we're headed with this topic, um, what the challenges are and what we might learn from it. But I thought it would be helpful to pause for a moment just to define what we mean by liberal arts programs. And what I'll share with you here is the definition that I use both in my scholarship and in practice. Um, but know that there are a lot of variations on this. And so what I mean when I'm talking about liberal arts programs or liberal education programs um, really hinges on three criteria. One is programs that have, and, and these three criteria, by the way, um, I think about in, in totality. So they need to exist together in my mind to, to be defined as a, a liberal arts program. Um, but first is a focus on comprehensive and multidisciplinary knowledge development and experience. The second piece of that definition is um, that the program would intentionally include broad intellectual learning outcomes. So these might be focused on competencies, um, which I would argue in, in favor of Phil's definition around workforce and citizenship development. So things like critical thinking, um, communication skills, writing, reading, speaking, uh, creativity and innovation, um, digital literacy, problem solving falls into this, um, and certainly learning how to learn or elements of self-reflection that might be really important for students and people who are participating in liberal education as they're going forward. And then the third piece of this definition, in my mind again, is that there is some element of social, ethical, or civic responsibility that underpins the kind of training that's being offered to students who are participating in these programs. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of challenges with these definitions to be, to be sure. Um, and it's important to note that in the broad global context, these programs are quite difficult to identify. Um, they're not always called liberal arts or liberal ed programs. Um, the term liberal is highly contentious. 
Um, and they're not always delivering um, a liberal arts or a liberal education per the definition that I've shared. Um, there are programs that will use that connotation um, to um, promote a certain kind of marketing, but not necessarily delivering on the education if in that way, if we were to be really pedantic about some sort of assessment. And they can be, as Phil pointed out, very controversial. I thought it might be also be helpful in addition to um, a definition to give just a very quick overview of what we're talking about when we're, we say a phenomenon of this growing interest in liberal education. And we're speaking predominantly outside of the US when we're talking about this. As Phil mentioned, um, there's a real dichotomy of challenge for liberal education in the US right now. So the very fact that this is growing externally um, is, is of high interest, I think, to, to those of us who work in the field. Um, just in general, there are over 200 programs now and they exist in over 58 countries worldwide. Um, Asia, Asia does demonstrate the largest area of growth. Um, what's interesting about these though is over 65% of these programs have developed since 1990. This is a new phenomenon. What that means though, is that it's very difficult to generalize about these programs and about the topic that we're talking about today. There's significant structural variability. Um, they range from being indigenous programs or autonomous programs that have, have been sort of home country grown. Um, there are a cadre of institutions that are the American University of or the American College of, and those are quite different than some of these indigenous programs. There's certainly branch campuses. There are partnership programs. Um, and it's important to note, I think, um, especially for several of us that are coming from the US context, that only about a third of these programs um, do have a formal affiliation with US institutions. So that was a surprise to me when I started doing this research. I thought I would perhaps find closer partnerships, but, it, but it's in fact not the case. Um, it's also different from region to region. Um, it depends on the regional context, the cultural context, national regulations and funding strategies that shape these programs, the mission of the individual programs certainly but what does this all tell all of us? It tells us that context matters. Um, and I think that my, my colleague, Hu Gun, is going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, my other colleague, Mary Ellen Boyle, has done some really good work in thinking about this context. Um, she is a Fulbright specialist and a professor at Clark University, just down the ro road from Boston College. And she has been working on ideas of organizational theory to understand education transfer and particularly applying it to these programs um, and thinking about education transfer and, and the anticipated and unanticipated consequences for these programs that have to do with that. So I call your attention to her research if you haven't seen it yet. With such a small number of programs, when we're looking globally, that 200 or so programs is not very many. So why should we care about this? Why is it worth paying attention to? Well, I'd offer a few things. Um, in context outside of the US, as Phil mentioned, liberal arts education is a radical approach to longstanding utilitarian undergraduate or first degree education systems. And so this is, this is a stark contrast to what we're used to seeing. It's also not always new and it's not always Western in its roots. And so I think there's, there's good reason for us to pay attention to Buddhist and Confucian Islamic traditions that are influencing or could be influencing in the future, these forms of education because it's a tie to local culture and, and values. Also, it's a serious example of higher education innovation. And we have much to learn from these programs, in my opinion. Um, I especially want to call attention to my colleague Noah Pickus, who I think is on the call. Um, he and, and Brian Penpraise are working on a terrific book project um, related to innovation and thinking about these programs and what we can learn from them. I think as well, um, we want to be thinking about um, how these programs coexist with traditional institutions. So are they on the periphery and they're going to be chugging along on their own or will they have some influence on the mainstream? And more importantly, as I've said many times um, in some of my writing and also in other talks that I've given, that these endeavors, these liberal education programs really have the potential to ignite social, 
political and cultural change. And that is at once their greatest asset, but it could also be their greatest challenge in terms of existing within the context that they're in. So in my opinion, what, what's next? What should we be thinking about going forward? Broadly speaking, there's two things. One is scholarship and one is networks. Um, and this um, ideas, these ideas come very much from my work with Mary Ellen Boyle. We are co-hosting or were co-hosting, I should say, um, a small workshop to help define some of the key questions that need to be investigated around this topic and need to be carried forward um, and, and simultaneously are influenced by practice and policy. Um, there was a workshop scheduled for July of 2020 in Luxembourg. That's now on hold, but I hope that we'll be resuming this conversation. But getting back to these, these two things. So in terms of scholarship, better understanding what's going on, trying to identify where there are synergies and places where we can generalize, although I don't think there are a lot, but trying to problematize these around specific questions and articulating those very clearly. And we need to get beyond case studies and normative perspectives about liberal education and why this could be valuable and what the problems with that are. And the second thing that I suggest is around networks. Um, and what I mean by that is a very, a very broad definition about connections. So better connections between these programs um, and that would include the United States. Um, I think, and I say this very much from my vantage at ACE looking across the US context, but I think there's a large missed opportunity um, for US liberal arts colleges, particularly in challenging times for them, for connections with these programs and institutions. There are some happening, but it is quite rare. And so I think there, there's a lot for us to learn broadly speaking. I also think that networks are essential for reciprocity. And what I mean by that are the, the real circular connections between research policy and practice, where these programs are concerned, how their work plays out, where we learn from their innovative practices and what we learn from the kind of curriculum, both in terms of pedagogy, but also in terms of um, the coursework and design for graduates that's being built. Um, the other piece of that is developing legitimacy and advocacy. Um, there's a lot of challenge around legitimacy for these programs, even some of the most prestigious ones and some of the ones that do have connections to other well-known global, um, global entities or global programs. And um, along with that, I would also say that networks are really critical for mobilizing these programs in both the local, national, and global context. And finally, to tackle some really tough questions. Um, an, an example of a few of those might be, how do liberal arts programs establish their legitimacy? How do they justify their work in countries where liberal arts education is especially um, uh, uh, not, not cohesive with some of the national, national interests? How do those programs establish themselves? What is the outcome for graduates who are leaving those programs if they choose to stay in their current national context? How do those programs practice equity-mindedness and leadership and equity leadership? What kind of access is available? Who is making the decisions? And how, once in students are into those programs, is equity being practiced? I mentioned before innovation. So how are they innovating? Um, what is their response to mission, to curriculum, to pedagogy, to funding structures, and what can we learn from those? Also, I think that networks can help definitely in, again, how these, these programs are relevant. So how they're relevant in their local communities, in their national context, and also in their global context, and what is the role these programs might play as individuals and together. And finally, how are they shaping higher education's future? What are we gonna learn from these programs? Will they have influence on more traditional um, higher education contexts? So I think those are really critical for us to think about both again in the scholarly, scholarly way and in a more um, defined, uh, uh, tangible way when we talk about networks and connections. So I'll leave with just one more thing in a segue to Hu Yan's um, focus on Asia. And that is just a couple of reflections on a piece that Noah Pickus and I wrote together in 2017. That was a result of some really significant conversations we had at Duke Kunshan University um, that, that we, we did during the summer leading up to that piece. And what I would say, just reflecting on those now, is we made several significant 
recommendations. And I looked over those in thinking about um, this talk today in our conversation. And what I would say is that our recommendations still hold, in my opinion. And I'd be very, very interested in hearing what others on the call think with one critical addition. And let me just say first, the recommendations that we put forth were to make general education matter, to invest in interdisciplinary integration, to focus on faculty incentives and development, embrace innovative pedagogy, scale quality programs, and study multiple um, sorry, study multiple traditions. I would add to that that programs and institutions also need to develop a mission-driven orientation for local global work. And what I mean by that, broadly speaking, is internationalization and global engagement and how these internet how these programs are defining themselves. So a few questions to leave you with. What are the connections of these programs to the local communities in which they reside? How are they internationalizing? And some programs have thought about this from the beginning. Um, a couple examples, in addition to Duke Kunshan University, our Amsterdam University College and um, NYU Shanghai, this internationalization for them was very core to their development. How do they connect with other programs globally? Again, getting back to the networking. And finally, and I'll leave with this, what agency do they have in the broader pursuit of developing workforce ready graduates in the context that Philip mentioned earlier and influencing higher education's mission more broadly, as well as more equi equ equitable social goals. And I will leave with that. Did I make my 10 minutes, Phil? You did, you did great, Kara. Thank you for, for that excellent timing. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Philip and Kara, for leaving the baton to me. And Kara, I just want to say yes, those recommendations hold for some of the world regions, and especially in East Asia. And I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about that. I'm going to call liberal arts and science education as LAS, L A S E LAS, which I think is just a cool acronym. A uh, very brief about the background of the study. The study asked if what was learned about lays in China three years ago has um, implication for a broader East Asian context. While the study is still ongoing, I think the general impression is yes, it does. Interviews with leaders of AALAU institutions suggest that the six recommendations mentioned in a China report are not only relevant, but also happening in some of the AALEU institutions. And by the way, AALEU stay, stands for the Alliance of Asian Liberal Arts Universities. And now I think the big question is, can East Asia have a robust advocacy framework for LAYS to leverage the growing interest? And that is something I am currently working towards. Now, if I may share my screen. Oh, can I share my screen? Okay, great. It's not working. Now I wanna mention a few consortium of higher education institutions that promote LAYS around the world. For example, ECLAS in Europe, uh, AALAU in Asia and GLAA, which is more cross-continental. The thing is, I think they're quite different if we simply look at their member institutions. And I think understanding these differences is key to understanding lays in different world regions, especially East Asia. Now, let me use some numbers to illustrate. If we compare the member institutions of GLAA, which is the Global Liberal Arts Alliance, and AALAU, which is more Asia focused, we actually can see a big difference in their focus. GLAA has 30 member institutions from 18 countries or regions and five continents. 43% are US institutions, 57% are non-US institutions, and the sole institution of the country or region. Only 6% country or region has more than one member institution. 73% institutions allegedly follow the American model, 
and all are LAS institution in a strict sense. So in short, it seems to suggest that GLAA follows the American model very closely. And if we compare that to AALAU, we see that AALAU has 26 member institutions from seven countries or regions and one continent. All institutions are from Asia, 73% are from South Korea, China, or Japan. 71% countries or regions have more than one member institution with South Korea, China, and Japan, each having no fewer than six institutions. Only 12% institutions allegedly follow the American model, and only 19% are LAS institution in a strict sense. So in short, AALAU does not, does not seem to follow the American model as closely. Now, what does that mean? It seems to suggest that East Asia is gathering a critical mass for lays and is ready to innovate more than follow a prescribed norm. This is not difficult to understand, I think, given the shared cultural heritage in the region as well as the unique characteristics of colleges and universities in this world region. For example, there are many Buddhist universities in this region. And I think the four important questions to ask are, what specific context calls for innovation? What is the innovation? What is the outcome? And what barrier still exists? And now I'm going to use three institutional examples to illustrate in Asia. Um, Lingnan University is the only public liberal arts university in Hong Kong. What is the context for innovation? The context is Lingnan competes with elite research universities in Hong Kong for local students, which means they cannot always enroll the very best students. What is the innovation? The innovation is keep competing, but also enroll second best students and focus on teaching. In fact, teaching and research share equal weight in faculty promotion and substantiation, which adopts a 40-40-20 framework for el el uh, evaluating faculty teaching research and service. What is the outcome? The outcome is Lingnan is internationally renowned for quality teaching including being ranked the second worldwide for quality education in the 2020 Times Higher Education University Impact rank Rankings. And according to the president I spoke with, this all came together by reimagining selectivity of enrollment for an LAS institution. In his words, he said, our students may not be elite upon enrollment, but they are after graduation. What, what is still the barrier? The barrier is that existing ranking systems are not robust enough to allow Lingnan fully leverage its strength. The second example I want to uh, mention is East China Normal University Mengxianchen College, which is a Shu Yuan with a research university within a research university of teacher education. What is the context for innovation? The context is character education is nationally called for in China, in Chinese higher education. And at the same time, the historical Shu Yuan education in China shares similarities with Lay's, but for Lang is not associated with higher education institutions in the country. What is the innovation? The innovation is establish and modify Shu Yuan on campus to promote lays, specifically integrate character education through non-credit bearing programs at Shu Yuan, commonly called the second classroom in the country. What is the outcome? The outcome is character education becomes more tangible through institutionalizing the Shu Yuan traditions. And according to the Dean of the Shu Yuan, making lays tangible through localized means is key to success. What is still the barrier? The barrier is Shu Yuan is still more um, inductive than integrated to the curriculum. Making Shu Yuan credit bearing might help, but lack of assessment practice is a still a barrier. 
Now, the last example I want to mention is Quinshan, uh, Duke Quinshan University, which is a Sino-American joint venture laboratory university. What is the context for innovation? The context is DKU is one of the joint ventures approved by the Chinese Ministry of Education for experimenting lays in a country. There is an entrepreneurial startup mindset with the university leadership, which is a Sino-American co-leadership model. And a university is poised to assess learning outcomes of its initial graduating classes. What is the innovation? The innovation is conduct institution-wide review to align disciplinary learning outcomes with interdisciplinary goals of the LAS curriculum and also deploy research and assessment initiatives to capture the distinctive features of the LAS curriculum. Um, what is the outcome? The outcome is still to be determined, but I'm very grateful to be um, brought on board recently for these projects. But it's safe to say that these, the research and assessment are key to effectively communicate LAS at a leadership level. What is the barrier? The barrier is perhaps uh, with the leadership communication of key concepts of LAYS, for example, interdisciplinarity. Now, what are the lessons learned so far after all, all these? Some lessons learned are first, it is perhaps not always necessary to argue over definitions, in my opinion. One thing the interviewees would often say about a successful LAS innovation is that it is not strictly LAYS, but it works, it makes sense. LAYS by concept can be a very hard sell, especially to an unsavvy audience. Sometimes higher education institutions or government look to LAYS to solve a very specific problem, such as diversifying the higher education system in China. Um, other times, they prioritize one aspect of LAYS, for example, the interdisciplinary curriculum. In any case, I think LAYS is more likely to take root or succeed if it makes sense not only to itself, but also to whoever adopts it. For example, if LAYS by concept does not make sense, uh, how about its individual components? Does interdisciplinary curriculum make sense? So in a sense, I think it is perhaps useful to adopt value-added thinking when it comes to what LAYS can do for the local contexts. Second, ranking systems. Another thing mentioned by the interviewee is that ranking systems are not nuanced enough for LAYS. Often the sentiment is, we do not have a proper reference point. And the situation can be worse because ranking means a lot to some students and parents from East Asia. And personally, I think it creates a vicious cycle with a lack of ground level assessment practice. Um, the idea is that the less the assessment, the less likely the ranking system is informed to advocate robust assessment practice. So for example, how would you, how, how can we um, assess or rank interdisciplinarity of a curriculum? So in a sense, I think it is perhaps useful to think along those lines to work toward a proper reference, po reference point for LAYS in East Asia. And lastly, does, does one size fit all for LAYS in East Asia? I don't think so, but I think there is merit in working towards a consensus about what characterizes LACE in East Asia over time. So it might be as tangible as an advocacy framework. In the shell, I don't know, but perhaps in the shell of AACU's LEAP, but with a spirit of East Asia. It is perhaps like a bicycle with an inner blue circle where we continue to focus on curriculum and pedagogy but also with a broader blue circle where we begin to challenge on new fronts such as um, upscaling and um, government relationships aligned with peer institutions in the East Asian frontier. So all in all, I think the content we're discussing is LACE 
but I think in the future, perhaps the approach is, is beyond and across. So that's everything I want to share for now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all three for your contributions and for uh, sharing all of these ideas. We are beginning to have a very dynamic um, conversation. Uh, so I, we'll start uh, taking some of the uh, some of the questions in a moment. Uh, but if I may for a second go off script a bit uh, and do something slightly unconventional, our colleague Ruth Hayhoe. Uh, from the University of Toronto is uh, in the call and she had asked if she could just uh, share a couple of thoughts related to uh, uh, the idea of uh, US, uh, Sino-US relations and the role of liberal arts education. So, so Ruth, since we have you, would you, would you share a couple of thoughts, please? Thank you so much. Uh it's a real honor to see my old mentor and dear friend Phil Opak. I haven't had a chance to meet for a number of years. And I think this topic is very, very important and particularly in the current geopolitics between US and China. I'm sure all of you are like me, very troubled. Canada is also caught up in very ugly relationships. And I believe liberal arts education is a wonderful way of keeping the communication open in a time of difficulty. And I just want to share, I was at Peking University uh, virtually about 10 days ago, they were celebrating the 40th anniversary of their graduate school of education revived, shut down by the Soviets in 52, revived in 1980 by a wonderful physics professor who was a provost and then head of the scent, his name was Wong Yong Chen. I brought him to Canada in 1992, very bad time, after Tiananmen, when the countries were not speaking to each other. Deng Xiaoping had just gone to Shenzhen to say, we're going to reopen, but the geopolitics were similar to now. And in my book, Knowledge Across Cultures, and Philip Philopolik has a chapter in here, this book goes back to 92, 28 years ago, republished in 2001. Professor Wang, who was a professor of physics, never lived abroad, had the most amazing vision of what the Chinese call Tongshu, you with general education, which is liberal arts education. Boya is the other term in Chinese. And I just want to read to you what he said, because I feel it's so remarkable. His vision at that time, he already passed away a few years ago, but he was such a visionary thinker. And what he said was, if higher education takes the training of scientific and technical personnel as its main focus, it will be totally inadequate. Broad knowledge, skills, and qualities of character, including the ability to manage human relations and add it to the cooperation and collaboration with others, positive motivation, skills of social interaction, and ability to observe and reflect on problems in a broad framework, the courage to take risks. I love that one. We've all got to think about it now. The courage to take risks and other holistic qualities are all viewed as especially important and necessary to the knowledge society. Notice, not knowledge economy. And I just want to comment, Chinese traditions holding two opposite philosophies, Confucianism and Taoism, always in constant interaction, a dialectic without synthesis. It doesn't have to be synthesized. You can see the, um, scrolls on my wall. One of them is cursive flowing script with Taoist content. One is formal official script with Confucian content. And the Chinese have a saying, her are futon, harmonious, but not conformity, no convergence. So I believe the scholars and the universities in China have the a deep capacity to nurture a liberal arts education that would help us to bridge this very difficult geopolitical divide that we are all feeling troubled by. Thanks so much, Your Honor, for giving me these two minutes. I was so happy to be here with you and hear about all the new thinking in liberal arts. We are also thinking about it here and developing a, a partnership to nurture that. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. That's that's wonderful. So um, so excellent. So we have a number of questions ready to go. I just wanted to open up uh, first to our panelists uh, because the the different contributions perhaps have invited some thoughts. I wonder if there are any quick initial reactions as I uh, right before I start posing the next set of questions. Um, Gerardo, perhaps I can answer uh, Mary Beth Marklin's question regarding uh, some of the memberships uh, about AALEU. So in addition to South Korea, China, and Japan, uh, other Asian countries who have member institutions in AALEU are Thailand, India, and I think Hong Kong has one, which is Lingnan University. And actually, right now, the Secretariat of AALEU uh, resides at Lingnan University. So I think in total, there are seven countries or regions in the AALEU. Thank you, Hui, and that's very helpful in terms of clarifying membership. Thank you. So the next question, I think, could be answered from any of the three initial perspectives. Um, so I invite any of you to, to uh, react to it. It's coming from Gavin Schwartzlieper, uh, who is referring to the, UA, the UK context, where both rankings have a great influence, as well as the teaching excellence framework um, and the issues of, of, of um, uh, compliance that come with that. So uh, he's sharing that uh, their program was put into sociology, um, but uh, it doesn't, um, uh, mm -hmm. but this didn't happen with English literature, geography, and so on. Um, so they would be very curious to hear more about how different folks uh, feel and, and, and how they deal with various ranking systems. In other words, how do we organize programs? Where do they fit? And what's the impact on rankings? So I invite any of you to, to contribute, hopefully all three of you. Well, can I, uh, let me start, since I've actually done a little bit of work on rankings. Um, the, the rankings as they exist today uh, are really not relevant to the liberal arts, unfortunately. Uh, or to much of anything else other than research, uh, because that's mainly what can be uh, uh, can can be measured. And I think it's a I mean it's a real problem for the kind of, if you will, the popular legitimacy of liberal arts programs within universities and liberal arts institutions that may may grow up. And that's I mean the, the only lesson we can take from that is, uh, we should pay less attention to the rankings, but I mean, that's not, not what's going to happen, unfortunately. Uh, and, you know, parents and students look at the rankings. So it's just, it's just a problem. Um, I had a question too, uh, which is only slightly rhetorical and maybe Ruth can have a, have a comment on it as well. And that is in the current political climate in, uh, uh, current and emerging political climate in China, uh, it will liberal education, and I, you know, my understanding is one of the main reasons that the topic became kind of salient in China in recent years is the, the critical thinking idea. Um, uh, does it have a future at all, given, you know, I mean, I know academics would like it, I know some students would like it, uh, but will it be permitted? And I also have the same uh, uh, question, maybe worry uh, about Hong Kong, where these ideas have you know, became, as I mentioned in my intro, uh, kind of uh, you know, popularized and even entrenched in the system in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and now with the changes in Hong Kong, I wonder if they'll survive. So I tend to be a pessimistic guy in general, as some of you know. Um, but I, 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 I worry about that because in the Asian context, China is, a, of course, has been the sort of most interesting player in the liberal arts area in recent years, anyhow. Thanks. Karen Huyen, would you care to comment? Yeah, um, let, let me just jump on this. I, I think, first of all, I, I think critical thinking is uh, inherently 
embedded in the Chinese cu culture. For example, if we look at Confucianism, there's so many uh, tenets uh, in the thoughts which promote uh, the educational thought related to critical thinking. Um, what, what, I, what I take um, about this is that I think China right now enjoys a very unique opportunity for liberal education, which is um, upscaling because it can upscaling with the government. The, 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 the fact is that if government is not into, if, if government does not show any interest, the liberal movement will not take place in China at all. But right now, I think there is a crack um, in, in, in the government trying to explore how to diversify the higher education system by playing with this concept. But they're very tentative right now. For example, a lot of the liberal education initiatives are related with general education um, curriculum. So if we look at the, the experiment, the I think the major experiment field is not at the, the liberal arts college per se or joint ventures, but largely within the, the traditional comprehensive universities where they identify the problems with their general education and they're trying to do something about it. And, and I think government always has a hand in it and we really enjoy this, um, this upscaling mechanism, a very unique upscaling mechanism of the government in, in this. And so I am relatively more optimistic uh, from this perspective. And I'll just react that, and, and I'm answering this or responding to this um, with, with a lot of humility because there are several people on this in this group today that have a lot more Chinese experience than I do. Um, but my perception, Phil, and from my time there, I really found that the hook in more contemporary spaces around this topic with the, the Chinese ministry and, and even with people who are just working in the education area but not necessarily affiliated with the ministry, that the hook for them was a lot more about creative thinking and, and developing uh, graduates who could be good, good problem solvers and innovative. And that's what I was hearing much more in my discussions there than the idea of critical thinking. And in a few contexts, um, I, I was even hearing from education leaders there that programs were allowed to exist in a bubble where critical thinking was concerned. Students were asked, for example, not to participate in any kind of social media where they would share information about their experiences in the classroom, which is a big ask. Um, and, and so there was almost a, um, a, a bubble built around a couple of these programs that allowed the kind of investigations and questions to be asked as long as you were in the bubble. Um, and so I, what I was hearing, again, someone please, please um, push back on this or add color to it. What I was hearing was a lot more about needing to develop problem solvers and, and a lot of creativity in terms of skill sets for it, frankly, for workforce development. Um, so I wasn't hearing about the critical thinking as an asset as much as it was a challenge and it was something that was trying to be contained. And maybe if we could, Ruth, uh, since Phil had mentioned, you may have a comment on this. That would be wonderful. I, I can't resist. You can all guess. I'm watching on a daily basis with great concern because it's become an Orwellian society with the social capitalist system. And I'm seeing people fleeing here from top universities because they've been observed raising a critical question in class and they felt the only way was to escape. So it is very serious right now, the kinds of repression. But the positive side, Chinese have lived under dictators for a very long time. There are many ways of thinking critically and talking critically where you can save your skin, largely by historical reference, by indirect reference. So there's an amazingly rich conversation that goes on in the academic community in China, which is protected from direct party punishment. And you know that's very, very important because that's happening more now than it has in the last 30 years. The other thing, I've watched China for 53 years. I went to Hong Kong in 67. Nobody predicted Deng Xiaoping after Mao's tyranny, but he appeared suddenly and look what came out of it. So I'm just waiting for the next Deng Xiaoping and I believe there are many deep thinkers, very concerned who are going to move into space once it opens up 
for a more accountable leadership and more space for critical thinking. But I think the key point, Kara, you've raised that they're very concerned about competition in the global knowledge economy. And they realize we're not going to do good science if we don't have real critical thinking and border edge exploration. And that requires the kinds of uh, nurturing of a liberal arts education. So I feel also, I think a little more um, optimistic than you felt, but I'm certainly watching carefully all the time. And I'm very thankful I can keep in touch. I'm having regular interactions using their version of Zoom. It's called VOOV by Tencent. And it works just as well, actually. I just had a long dialogue with students in uh, Dalian using Vuv, and I've got another one coming up with Shanghai's International Studies University in a few days. And nobody's telling me there's things you can't say. Of course, I'm cautious, but I, I'm, I'm more optimistic in the longer term. There's a richness in the Chinese traditions that allows opposite views to constantly interact. And I think that's not going to be uh, wiped out by any kind of dictatorial regime. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. I think it um, I think to stay with the role of governments, one of the questions uh, that's coming uh, from Kyle Long, it, uh, it has to do with structures, right? So how are these institutions? And I think uh, we have discussed different structures, right? By national partnerships and um, in, in different types of institutions as well. But how are these institutions conducting liberal arts education in Asia funded? Um, how are they governed? Uh, are you seeing any trends or patterns perhaps? Um, in, in how does the funding and governance perhaps influence the local legitimacy, right? To address some of these topics that as you all have mentioned can become controversial at times. Uh, and so this is an open question to, to uh, any and all uh, or for panelists. I'll throw out very quickly that from the scholarly standpoint, we don't know. There's very little um, comprehensive understanding. And, and to be fair, this would be a very hard question to investigate um, in a, a very solid social scientific way. Um, given that uh, we don't have good ways, although Phil, you and your team have taken a good stab at this in the past, but we don't have good ways to look across ministries. We don't have a good way to look across funding structures, national structures for doing funding in, in higher education. But, um, but this is a highly, this is, this is exactly the kind of question that, that I'm proposing we really need to know something more about. Um, and that connection between the legitimacy and the funding and the competition um, really is at the heart, I think, of some of the potential survival of these programs and their potential to influence beyond that. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, perhaps one thing I can share, I think this is perhaps a very nuanced example, but for Du Quan Chan University, it is a joint liberal arts, uh, joint venture liberal arts university, Sino-American um, model. Um, the, the funding structure is that Duke University collaborated with Wuhan University and together with the municipal government of, of Quinshan, which is a county in Jiangsu province in eastern, eastern coastal area. So I think one challenge related to that is to align, you know, um, priorities of, of different stakeholders, obviously Duke University, Wuhan University um, might not be uh, fully aligned in initial, you know, initiative stages. And also there is this player of the municipal government who is funding the university. They have their own um, initiatives, priorities. For example, um, this is something I, I, I discussed with some people with uh, DKU is that the municipal government's uh, priorities may not be aligned with the university, especially they're not very, very savvy about the concept of liberal arts. They're thinking about if a university is brought in, the, the research and the R&D capacity may be helpful to the development of the municipal government. But, but, if, but in, in the process, they may find that this, this may, not, may not be the case. And there need to be in a process of uh, 
uh, education in order to learn what liberal arts means for the municipal government and what um, impact they are going to expect from contributing to this joint initiative. So that, that is something I just want to share. Great, thank you. I, of course, uh, I'm very excited about the conversation that we are having and apprehensive about the time, because of course we scheduled for an hour and then we are overly ambitious about what we can accomplish. Uh, so of course we have a few more questions to address, but I also um, would like to maybe offer the space to all of our panelists uh, as we are having this very rich engagement, whether you would have any thoughts um, in case that anybody in our audience may need to uh, uh, end promptly and disconnect from the call. So rather than taking one more question, I'd rather perhaps turn it over to our panelists and maybe you could offer some, um, some thoughts. Of course, you can vote me down and then we can go to the next question instead. Go to question. Excellent. Thank you, Phil, for uh, uh, for that. Um, so excellent. So the next question that I uh, that that we have uh, is actually uh, for uh, for Dr. Ye in relation to the outcomes of liberal arts education. I think this actually could be um, responded from more than one perspective. So I invite any of our panelists to to do that. So. What are they? What What are we looking at in terms of outcomes of liberal arts education? Uh, is it uh, broad learning? Is it critical thinking, as it has been mentioned already? A sense of social responsibility, uh, and also, what are we talking about when we talk about being elite or receiving an elite education, which has been a theme throughout our webinar? Well, this is, I think this is also a very important question and also a very challenging one. I think uh, given my uh, unique perspective uh, of my relationship with DKU, I can share that we are trying to push toward that direction is to identify learning outcomes. One focus is we're trying to align disciplinary and interdisciplinary learning outcomes, which is not always the focus um, traditionally. And we're trying to do that. And also I think DKU as an example, have very specific focus and they try to align institutional vision with disciplinary and interdisciplinary um, outcomes, focusing on the uh, globalism, um, interdisciplinarity, and uh, many elements of uh, liberal arts education to promote critical thinking and these characters. So I can only, I think this is a very important question, but I can right now only uh, answer from the specific example of DKU. I hope that's helpful. Um, very brief comment. Uh, the, the science of measuring learning outcomes doesn't exist. And we learned through a failed OECD experiment a few years ago that doing this cross culturally, cross nationally is a complete failure. So it's very, very difficult to do this. And back to the question, it's all of the above. I mean, all of those elements are certainly integral to most people's concept, as Kara pointed out, uh, of, of a, what, what liberal education is. Different institutions, different countries take pieces of it and focus on what they think is most important. Uh, and of course, that's that's just fine. There isn't a uniform approach to it. And in fact, if you look at different liberal arts traditions going back a long time in the United States, you'll find in, you know, colleges and universities which have been very serious about uh, a liberal arts approach to things with quite different philosophies, outcomes, curricula, and so on. And that's just fine. Um, and I think you know, uh, in, in the global context, um, we're at an early stage of, of, of all this. And uh, I think, um, you know, going forward, we'll sort of see what, uh, how, how, how it uh, uh, transpires uh, uh, from the, uh, I am significantly in the current context 
less optimistic than my colleagues are about the the you know the at least the immediate future in uh, uh, in, in in China, and it's nice that Ruth has a long historical perspective, which is appropriate for someone who's been in the China context uh, for many years. Um, I think it's going to take a while. Maybe in the long run, it'll work out. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank you all. Uh, of course, we know that uh, schedules are very tight and we often jump from call to call all day long. Uh, we want to thank you all for spending uh, part of your afternoon or your evening uh, or your morning, perhaps, depending on where you are with us in the Center for International Higher Education. We have included in the chat the direct link to the publication that, that Dr. Godwin was referring to during her remarks and we invite you to stay connected with us through our different publications. And again, thank you for joining us and special thanks to our panelists today. Uh, take care and we look forward to having you in our next uh, webinar or event. Take care. <laughs>